Good evening. And uh, we, we want to give you a really warm welcome uh, to Westlake, especially uh, if you're joining us live and you've uh, made the uh, trip through the torrential rain. <laughs> You're really glad. I, I was saying to someone that I feel a little bit responsible because I, I kept saying that I was uh, missing Scotland. So uh, the Lord's just given me a little taste of Scottish weather. We're delighted that you If you're joining us by live stream, we are glad that you've joined us as well. But what we're going to do now is we're going to stand and uh, pray together as we begin worship. And then the worship group is going to come and lead us. And so we've got a prayer. Let's stand together. And I'll do the, the let's pray bit. And then we're all going to do uh, the everyone bit. And then Ben and the team are going to come and lead us in worship. Let us pray. Lord, it is good for us to be together in this place, through these screens, with these people, as your people. Together, listening for your voice, united by your spirit. In this time of worship, we ask that you would inspire our worship, take pleasure in our praise. Tell us about your kingdom of kindness so that we can seek it. Show us your justice so that we may live today committed to doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with you, our God. Amen. Well, good afternoon, Westlake, and welcome on behalf of the worship team, it's great to see you all again, at least those of you that uh, we can see in front of us. It's wonderful to be back in, in this room on a Sunday afternoon, and I can't tell you how happy we are here that we can be here, up here playing live and singing before you after all these months of COVID restrictions. So that's uh, uh, really welcome to all of you. The first of our two songs today talk of the need for compassion, love, mercy, and forgiveness. And look around the world today and we can all see how much these things are needed. But we have a mighty God to save us. So please stand for our first song, which is Mighty to Save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior. Take me as you find me. 
to see. Sing a song called Build My Life, worthy of every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 21, we find the story of Naboth's vineyard and also the story of King Ahab, who had many lands and much wealth. However, 
Out of pure greed, he wanted Naboth's land to turn into a garden. But Naboth said to the king, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. So King Ahab went back home, very sad and annoyed by Naboth's answer. The king of Israel, who had much land and wealth, had a temper tantrum because Naboth wouldn't sell him his inheritance. It was then that Ahab had Naboth killed and took possession of his vineyard. Columbia's history is not that different from this story in the Bible. In Colombia and in the Middle Magdalena region, there are many stories like it. In many cases, people with lots of money and power have arrived to steal the land from small farmers and their communities. Ahab and Naboth's just. Yeah, why is that? Why do humans care so much about justice? Well, the Bible has a fascinating response to that question. On page one, humans are set apart from all other creatures as the image of God. Yeah, God's representatives who rule the world by his definition of good and evil. And this identity, it's the bedrock of the Bible's view of justice. All humans are equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who you are. And that would be nice if we all did that, but we know how the world really works. And the Bible addresses that too. It shows how we are constantly redefining good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. Yeah, self-preservation. And the weaker someone is, the easier it is to take advantage of them. And so in the biblical story, we see this happening on a personal level, but also in families and then in communities and in whole civilizations that create injustice, especially towards the vulnerable. But the story doesn't end there. Out of this whole mess, God chose a man named Abraham to start a new kind of family. Specifically, Abraham was to teach his family to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Yeah, doing righteousness, that's a Bible word I don't really use, but what comes to mind is being a good person. But what does that even mean, being good? The biblical Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah, and it's more specific. It's an ethical standard that refers to right relationships between people. It's about treating others as the image of God. With the God-given dignity they deserve. And this word justice, it's the Hebrew word mishpat. It can refer to retributive justice. Like if I steal something, I pay the consequences. Exactly. Yet most often in the Bible, mishpat refers to restorative justice. It means going a step further, actually seeking out vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. Yeah, some people call this charity. But mishpat involves way more. It means taking steps to advocate for the vulnerable and changing social structures to prevent injustice. So justice and righteousness are about a radical, selfless way of life. Yeah, and you find this idea all over the Bible. Like here, in the book of Proverbs, what does it mean to bring about just righteousness? Open your mouth for those who can't speak for themselves. And what do these words mean for the prophets, like Jeremiah? Rescue the disadvantaged and don't tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. And like here, look in the book of Psalms. The Lord God upholds justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, and sets the prisoner free but he thwarts the way of the wicked. Whoa, he thwarts the wicked? Yeah, in Hebrew, the word wicked is rasha. It means guilty or in the wrong. It refers to someone who mistreats another human, ignoring their dignity as an image of God. So justice and righteousness is a big deal to God. Yes, it's what Abraham's family, the Israelites, were to be all about. They ended up as immigrant slaves, being oppressed unjustly in Egypt. And so God confronted Egypt's evil, declaring them to be rasha, guilty of injustice. And so he rescued Israel. But the tragic irony of the Old Testament story is that these redeemed people went on to commit the same acts of injustice against the vulnerable. And so God sent prophets who declared Israel guilty. 
But they weren't the only ones. There's injustice everywhere. Yeah, some people actively perpetrate injustice. Others receive benefits or privileges from unjust social structures they take for granted. And sadly, history has shown that when the oppressed gain power, they often become oppressors themselves. So we all participate in injustice, actively or passively, even unintentionally. We're all the guilty ones. And so this is the surprising message of the biblical story. God's response to humanity's legacy of injustice is to give us a gift, the life of Jesus. He did righteousness and justice, and yet he died on behalf of the guilty. But then God declared Jesus to be the righteous one when he rose from the dead. And so now Jesus offers his life to the guilty so that they too can be declared righteous before God, not because of anything they've done, but because of what Jesus did for them. The earliest followers of Jesus experienced this righteousness from God, not just as a new status, but as a power that changed their lives and compelled them to act in surprising new ways. Yeah, if God declared someone righteous when they didn't deserve it, the only reasonable response is to go and seek righteousness and justice for others. This is a radical way of life, and it's not always convenient or easy. It's courageously making other people's problems my problems. This is what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about a lifetime commitment fueled by the words of the ancient prophet Micah. God has told you, humans, what is good and what the Lord requires of you is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You read the prophets in the Old Testament, they say that unless our worship, what we do is we gather like this, is connected to that stuff, standing up for people, working for justice, caring for the poor, then God would really rather we didn't do any of this. And that's why, as a church, we, we support some mission projects. It's a way of expressing that justice that God has worked into our DNA. And uh, we're just about to give you an update on one of those projects. Krista uh, has got a presentation for us about uh, a, an orphanage in Kenya. But at the back, you'll find the offering box and uh, everything today that we give will go towards that project. So this is one of the ways that collectively as a congregation, we try to act justly. Here we go. And hope for a future through education. Hello, Westlake. My name is Krista, and this month our overseas mission focus is on the Maisha Children's Home in Kenya. The name Maisha means life, and Maisha rescues orphans from the dark and hopeless slums Maisha of Nairobi. Maisha has rescued 22 and provides children them with all their basic and needs. raises them and in hope a for a future through education. Maisha has rescued 22 children to date and raises them in a Christian family environment where they go to church, read the Bible, say prayers together, and learn about the unconditional love of Jesus. Over the past few months, Kenya, like the rest of the world, has been in a Christian family environment. Schools where they were go to opened again at the beginning of the year, Hello, Westlake. only to be shut down shortly afterwards. Schools have just opened once more recently. The end of school exams, which were supposed to take place last November, have only just taken place. And now we are eagerly awaiting the results. So what has the Maisha family been up to during these long months of being stuck at home with no online schooling? Well, the Maisha children have been busy learning in new ways. With the help of a supervisor, they have started raising pigs. In addition to the chickens, goats and fish already at Maisha. And the children even built this impressive pig house. Volunteers from a local church have also been visiting and giving them spiritual guidance, but also practical life-giving therapy, including cooking and music workshops. But for me, 
The most encouraging news to come out of Maisha in the past few months was to learn that one of our teenagers, John, committed his life to Jesus Christ. Several of our teenagers and young adults have now made Jesus their Lord and Saviour. This is what makes all the hard work, endless fundraising and the challenge of raising children with traumatic pasts and often troubled behaviour truly worthwhile. Maisha relies entirely on donations to cover our costs and the pandemic has made fundraising even more difficult than usual. We are so grateful that Westlake has been a faithful partner of Maisha over the years and trust that you who are watching will be touched in your hearts to continue to give generously. Finally, I contacted a few of the Maisha teenagers this past week and asked them to write a short testimony of how Jesus has impacted their lives at Maisha. I leave you with their own words. May they encourage you and thank you once again, Westlake, for your continued support. want to uh, come and pray now. Uh, you, you probably wouldn't believe this, but I was a little bit of a chatterbox when I was young. And uh, I remember my dad quite often saying, will you just listen? And prayer is a little bit like that, isn't it? We're used to prayer being all about us talking. And I wonder how often our Heavenly Father is saying, Will you just listen? And so what I want us to do is something a little bit different today. Instead of us speaking and praying, we're going to follow the advice that we hear in the Psalms where it says, be still and know that I am God. That often in silence, we become more aware of God's presence and so we can hear his voice more clearly. And so we're going to have a few moments of silence and I'm going to invite God's Spirit to come. And I want you to say that you're open. Perhaps the Lord will uh, impress someone on your heart that he wants you to contact. Maybe he'll speak into your life about something particular that's going on at the moment. Maybe he'll give you a message to share with someone else. But it'll only happen if we are listening. And so let's bow and pray and listen. Lord, I pray that you would give us an awareness of your presence. We remember that often in your word that you tell us to have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. And so, Lord, we, we pray in these few moments of silence that you would do just that, that you would speak into our lives, that you would lay people and situations upon our heart. And, Lord, not only would we hear your voice, I pray that we would be obedient to your voice. Be still and know that I am God. 
Well, would you forgive us that we're often so busy and listening to so many other voices that we really just stop and listen? Lord, I pray that now if you've spoken into our lives, that we would follow through on the things that you've spoken to us about. Give us the courage, Lord, to pray for that person, to approach that person, to support that person. Lord, we pray this tangible sense of your presence would continue with us as we open our hearts and minds to you. Amen. Ben, would you come and lead us in worship? splendor of the king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice please stand and we're going to sing how great is our god The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice, how great. 
we are uh, in the, the middle of a, a series about Elijah, uh, the prophet in the Old Testament. And uh, I hope that you've been hearing God speak to you through that. Next week is going to be a special service. Next week is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, that's a really special day for the church. We, we could say it's the birthday of the church. We're going to be thinking about whether we really want more of God. We're also going to share communion. And I, I just wanted to, to let those on the live stream know that so that you could uh, get some uh, juice, wine, and bread together and join us as we share communion next week. Now, the video we saw earlier, uh, we, we thought we might have some children. I'm sorry if the Naboth uh, vineyard thing seemed a little bit uh, young, but it introduced us to the first half of the story of Naboth vineyard. And what I'd like to do now is to read the second uh, half of that story, beginning to read it First Kings chapter 21 and verse uh, 17. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard, where he's gone to take possession of it. And say to him, this is what the Lord says, have you not murdered a man and seized his property? And then say to him, this is what the Lord says, in the place where dogs lick up Naboth's blood, Dogs will lick up your blood, yes, yours. And Ahab said to Elijah, so you've found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I'm going to bring disaster on you and I will wipe out your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Basha, son of Ahijah because you've aroused my anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord said, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. There was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife, he behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before the Lord. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted. And he lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he's humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Lord, we pray that you would open our minds and give us hearts that are responsive as you speak to us through your word. Amen. Have any of you done one of those uh, DNA tests from places like Ancestry.com? They're a little bit gross. You have to spit into a test tube. You send away the test tube and then they'll send you back results with your DNA, uh, revealing your ancestry in a way, explaining some of your physical characteristics because that's what DNA expresses itself in. The, the video we watched earlier on uh, tells us about the first half of the story of Naboth Vineyard, how uh, out of greed and jealousy that Ahab and, Je and Jezebel uh, killed Naboth and stole his land. Uh, what I want to suggest to you is that the second half of the story that we read that concentrates on the Lord sending Elijah to Ahab about what he's done, uh, that that's a kind of DNA test for us as God's family. In what the Lord says to Ahab through Elijah and what he says to Elijah about Ahab, what we have is a, a sort of a DNA 
tests for God. Uh, God reveals two essential aspects of his character, his DNA, what theologians call his divine attributes. And so we're, we're going to look at them and see what implications they have for us. So let's first of all look at what the Lord had to say to Ahab through Elijah. He told Elijah to find Ahab and say to him, this is what the Lord says, have you not murdered a man and seized his property? And then say to him, this is what the Lord says, in the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood, yes, yours. And basically there, what the Lord is saying is, uh, he's sending Elijah to Ahab and saying through him, Ahab, I'm going to judge you. I'm going to judge you and your dynasty and I'm going to get justice for Naboth and his families and all your other innocent victims. You murdered Naboth and his family and so you and your family will suffer my judgment and experience the same fate, the same kind of death. So what does that statement reveal to us about God's DNA, about his fundamental character? The essential attributes of God. Well, it, it tells us very clearly that God is a God of justice. That's why I wanted us to watch that video earlier in the service. It does a brilliant job in explaining that justice is part of God's DNA. It's a fundamental aspect of his character. It's one of his most prominent attributes. Now, a little bit of background will uh, maybe help us understand this better. The gods of the surrounding nations like Baal, who Jezebel and Ahab have been worshipping, are depicted as macho gods, big, strong gods. And they were basically on the side of the strong and the powerful. And that's why Jezebel did what she did. Uh, that's what you did if you worship Baal. You, you took what you wanted from whoever got in your way. That's why Jezebel thought nothing of killing Naboth and taking his land. In contrast... The video reminds us that the living God, the God revealed in the Bible, is a God of justice. He's on the side not of the strong and the powerful, but surprisingly the oppressed and the victims of injustice. He is with the powerless against the powerful. And that video also reminded us that when God wanted to spread his justice in the world and re-establish it, what he did was he created a community, a people who would share his DNA. So Israel as a nation was to embody God's justice so that those who came into contact with it would see and experience God's justice. Now, here's the really important point from today. God's DNA is to be the DNA of God's people. God's attributes have to be the activities of God's people. And so because Israel served the God of justice, they were to act justly. Uh, the book of Proverbs kind of sums up all the teaching of the Old Testament when it tells God's people, speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. God's people are to share God's DNA. They are to be passionately concerned about justice and stand up and defend the weak and the vulnerable. And the king was to have an especial role in this. The king not only was to act justly, but he was to see that justice was carried out throughout the nations. And that's why what Jezebel and Ahab did was so serious. They, they were fundamentally contradicting what God had called the king to be. And God's solution was whenever God's people did not act justly, he raised up prophets who would confront them 
both with his, with his call to justice, but also his just punishment on those who had victimized others. And that's exactly what he called Elijah to do to Ahab over Naboth's vineyard. Now, we don't have time to look at it in depth tonight, but as we move on from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we discover that same DNA in Jesus. He mixed with and was concerned for the poor, the powerless, the downtrodden, the exploited, and the church he created was to share that DNA as well. So just as Israel was a community of justice, so the church is to reflect that same concern for the poor, the powerless, the vulnerable, and the oppressed. The church, just like Elijah, is to have a prophetic role in speaking out again in injustice and working for justice. Remember what we said earlier, that God's attributes are to be the activities of God's people. And the great thing is that that's just what you see when you look at church history. You see this DNA of God, this DNA of justice, working itself out through God's people. And that's why Harriet Trubman had created the Underground Railway to help slaves escape in the United States. That's why William Wilberforce had worked tirelessly to abolish the slave trade in the British Empire. That's why Lord Shaftesbury worked against the exploitation of children in Victorian Britain. That's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer stood up against the Nazis. That's why Martin Luther King stood against racism in the US and why Desmond Tutu stood up against a party in South Africa. Just like those people, we have to have that DNA. We have to be people who act justly and stand against injustice in our families, in our communities, in our workplaces, in our nations, and in the whole world. We have to be a voice for the victims of injustice and advocates for the oppressed. Now, how do we do that? Well, we do it, of course, in our own families and workplaces. That's partly why, as a church, we support some of the mission projects we do. Can I tell you about two great organisations that allow you to express this DNA that should be inbuilt to you as a Christian? Open Doors stands up for persecuted Christians and demands justice for them. And the International Justice Mission it stands up especially against modern-day slavery. Those are three, two great organisations. He is how you can find them. They, that would be a great way for you to get involved in expressing the justice that should be part of who you are as a Christian. Jeffrey Dahmer was a man who was reviled as the absolute epitome of depravity. In 1994, he was on death row in the Columbia Correctional Institution in the United States for crimes that, quite frankly, turned most people's stomachs. He had not only killed 17 young men, but he had done unspeakable things to their bodies. And in a television interview, Dahmer said that, that he longed for some inner peace. A woman called Mary Mott heard that interview and decided to send Dama some Bible studies about the gospel, about how he could find peace. Dama wrote back and asked for more. And to cut a very long story short, Mary Mott asked a pastor called Roy Ratcliffe to visit Dama in prison and to share the gospel with him. Somewhat hesitantly, Ratcliffe did that and explained to Dama God's love and how through Christ's death on the cross, we are saved by grace and we can be forgiven no matter what we have done. And eventually, Jeffrey Dahmer's dark soul was touched by God's grace as he accepted Jesus as his saviour and Lord. And Dahmer's blood-stained hands were washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. 
And that deranged cannibal became another sinner saved by grace. He was later murdered by a fellow inmate, and as far as we know, he is in heaven with his Lord and Saviour today. Now, the news of Dama's salvation was not widely welcomed. Even by many Christians, people were cynical and doubtful and angry. And it seemed like even many believers thought that there were some people who had done things that were so twisted, detestable and unspeakable that, that they somehow sinned themselves beyond God's grace and God's grace was not available to them. I kind of suspect that many of Ahab's contemporaries would have thought that about him, that Ahab belonged in the same kind of category as Jeffrey Dahmer. He had murdered hundreds of God's prophets. He'd been involved in worship that involved the, the murder, the sacrifice of children. He had oppressed, killed, and denied justice to innocent people. Ahab was the worst of the worst. Do you remember how we, we just read shortly, a little while ago, how he was described? There was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Urged on by Jezebel, his wife, he behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord had drove out of Israel. And many people cheered when Jeffrey Dahmer was sentenced to death. And, and probably many people in Israel celebrated when they heard that God had pronounced his judgment on Ahab and his family. And I also suspect they were equally shocked and angered by what happened next. Well, let's look at what the Lord says to Elijah about Ahab. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Ahab responds to God's judgment on him by putting on sackcloth and ashes. And in that culture, that was the way that you showed outwardly what was happening inwardly in your heart. And what Ahab was doing was showing that he was repenting. Repenting is far more than, than feeling sorry for what we've done. Repenting is about a fundamental reorientation of our life. It's about a change of mind that leads to a change of direction in our life. Ahab was changing his mind about sin. He was deciding that it was no longer acceptable and he would no longer live that way. Repentance actually means to turn around. And so what it means is that he was sinning, but he turned from his sin to face God and to ask for God's acceptance and forgiveness. So what was the Lord's reaction to this? The Lord, despite everything that Ahab had done, forgives him and says that he won't carry out this just punishment on him, but will eventually bring his dynasty to an end. Now let's just think about that for a moment. Ahab, we've just heard him described as being vile, as someone who was sold out to doing evil, and yet God forgives him and accepts him. In doing that, the Lord reveals another key component of his DNA. Not only is he a God of justice, but he is a God of grace. A God who treats people who turn to him in genuine repentance in a way that they don't deserve. Grace is absolutely fundamental to God's nature. And you will never understand the message of the Bible and never understand God until you understand grace. 
I love the way a theologian called Preston Sprinkle defines grace. He says, grace is the unconditional acceptance given to an undeserving sinner by an unobligated God. I'm going to read that again. It's so important. Grace is the unconditional acceptance given to an undeserving sinner by an unobligated God. When they turned to him, King Ahab and Jeffrey, De Jeffrey Dahmer were definitely two undeserving sinners. And God accepted them, but he wasn't obligated to. He did it out of grace. Rico Tice, who is the author of the Christianity Explain course, said that God being a God of grace means accepting that we are more sinful than we ever realised and more loved than we ever dreamed of. Grace means you understanding that you were more sinful than you ever realised, but you're more loved than you ever dreamed of. I wonder what you make of God being a God of grace. People often talk about the scandal of grace, and what they mean is that all too often people find the concept of grace scandalous, offensive even. That's because, you see, if grace is unmerited and undeserved, that means that to accept it, we have to accept that we are unworthy and undeserving. That we have to say that, that we are in need of grace as much as Ahab and Jeffrey Dahmer were. And the problem is that we don't like being put in a category with people like that. I want to read to you the key passage in the New Testament about grace. This is the passage that if you understand it, you'll understand Christianity. But if you don't understand it, you will never understand what Christianity is all about. It's from Ephesians 2 and it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, faith and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. I want to point out a couple of things from that key passage. It says that we are all in the same category as King Ahab and Jeffrey Dahmer. We're all people who have rebelled against God and failed in our lives. And that means just like Jeffrey Dahmer and King Ahab we all need God's grace and we can all be saved by grace. The Apostle Paul, who wrote those words, uh, just wanted to make sure that, that we absolutely understood this. So he says, for it is by grace you're saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Another translation of the Bible maybe puts it with even greater clarity. For by grace you've been saved by faith. Nothing you could ever do would earn the salvation. For it was the love gift from God that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast for salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. 
someone once said that the because of all of that, grace is good news to the unrighteous, but bad news for the self-righteous. And what they meant by that is that you're either amazed by grace or offended by grace. In fact, I think that tonight, unless you are amazed by grace or offended by grace, you haven't actually understood grace at all. There are going to be two basic reactions to grace, to this grace that are part of God's DNA, that God treats people who turn to him not the way they deserve, but on the basis of his love. And some of us are going to be offended because you think that you don't need grace in the same way as Ahab and Damer did. And others of you find this as good news because you know that you need grace. And I want to say to you tonight, if there is grace for Ahab, there is grace for you. The great lesson of Ahab's life is that no one can sin themselves beyond God's grace. God's grace is always greater. Listen, if there was grace for Ahab, there is grace for you. And grace is greater than your worst sin. Grace is bigger than your biggest failure. Grace is greater than your deepest regret. Grace is greater than all your guilt. Now remember, we are God's family. So God's DNA is to be our DNA. God's attributes are to be our activities. And that means not only are we to be saved by grace, but we are to live by grace. We have to experience it and extend it to other people told you in the past about David Siemens, who was a, a, a Methodist pastor and a seminary professor who wrote this book in the 80s called Healing for Damaged Emotions that had a, a huge impact on people. And in it, he says something I think really quite profound. He said, many years ago, I was driven to the conclusion that the two major causes of most emotional problems among evangelical Christians are these. The failure to understand, receive, and live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness. And the failure to give out that unconditional love, forgiveness, and grace to other people. We read, we hear, we believe a good theology of grace, but that is not the way we live. The good news of the gospel of grace has not penetrated to the level of our emotions. I believe that God wants me to tell someone tonight that God's grace means that you need to start treating yourself with grace. Maybe some of you have realised that there's an apparent contradiction there. We've been saying on the one hand that God is a God of justice who cannot overlook injustice and will rightly punish those responsible. And yet we've also said that God is a God of grace who accepts us no matter what we do and will turn aside his punishment. Does that mean to be a God of grace, that God's got to stop being a God of justice? Or that to be a God of grace, he can't be a God of justice? The video we saw earlier sort of explained the paradox of how God can be a God of grace and a God of justice at the same time. And the answer is Jesus and his death. For you see, on the cross, God's justice and God's grace come together. God didn't turn a blind eye or sweep under the carpet Ahab's sin or Jeffrey Dahmer's sin or my sin or your sin. Rather, on the cross, in Jesus, he accepts his own just punishment for our sin so that he can accept us. On the cross, God's justice fell on Jesus so that through Jesus, God's gift of grace 
can come to you. And I need to end by asking you all a very direct question. Have you, like Ahab, turned from your sin and asked to receive God's grace and forgiveness? You know, if you've never done that, I'd love to talk to you about it. You could contact me at this email address and we could discuss it without any pressure. So we've learned tonight that God's attributes are to be our activities. His DNA is to be our DNA. And so I want to remind you of what the prophet Micah said about this. He said that what God requires of us is to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. And now as God's people, let's do that. During lockdown, uh, we learned that sometimes we need to talk about how this applies to our life. And so what, we, what we'd like to do just for 10 minutes is for you to turn to about four or five people around you. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. And there's a question going to appear here. And, and it's the quote that I read earlier. And we'd like you to just talk about that. Now, there's no pressure. Uh, you could just listen uh, or you can contribute. But we are trying to think about how we live this out when we leave these doors. And uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, sorry, if you're on the live stream, we'd love you to join us on Zoom. You should have the link. If you don't, you can get the link by sending us an email at contact us at westlakechurch.com. So let's do that quickly for about 10 minutes. There we go. Let's do that now. What better song could we possibly have than This Is Amazing Grace? I think a good appropriate conclusion. the power 
done for me. All that you've done for me. Thank you. Uh, as we said earlier, someone will show you out, but uh, really, there's only one text mm -hmm. that can end for us tonight. But it says, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.